I just wanted to say that take this opportunity to tell you a little bit about how awesome she is. She's completely cleaned up our resident room, and, <laughs> which probably has 15 to 20 years of past resident things. <coughs> um, she does a lot of things for us that make, I think, residents' lives easier. She made epic. Um, uh, she begged the Epic people to make a list of inpatient consults for us so that we can ease the transition care. Actually, Russ did that. Oh, Russ did that. She begged them to get it fixed then. Um, but she does a lot of things like that. Helps like with different Epic bugs. And um, she also, there was a time where we had our morning lectures where she was frantically sewing on pockets to our call bag to help things get organized. That, that call bag eventually stopped rolling. But anyway, she's going to be a great retina specialist, a great researcher, and I'm excited to hear about our carotenoids. Carotenoid. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> All right. Um, so I'm going to talk about a clinical uh, research project that I've been working on uh, with Dr. Bernstein, uh, and you know some of the preliminary data that we have. Uh, we're still uh, continuing the study and hope to uh, recruit more patients. But we're going to talk. I'm going to talk about the uh, role of carotenoids in uh, pattern dystrophy. First, I'm going to give you uh, some background on pattern dystrophy. Um, as one of the other residents pointed out, you may have the impression that it's just uh, a grab bag of uh, things that are characterized by spots in the retina. But there are actually are uh, very few uh, specific uh, diseases that are part of this category uh, that are uh, shown to be linked by their you know, clinical features and also genetics as well. Uh, so the one that's the most common is adult uh, onset foveomacular vitelliform dystrophy, which I'll call adult vitelliform or AFVD uh, for short, as well as uh, butterfly-shaped uh, pigment dystrophy, uh, as we can see over here, and uh, Sjogren reticular dystrophy of the RPE. Uh, there's a couple uh, other rare entities that also fall in this category of pattern dystrophies. Uh, so a bit more about the genetics of pattern dystrophies. I'm going to talk mostly about vitelliform because since it's the most common uh, pattern dystrophy, we know the most about its genetics. Uh, unfortunately, we actually don't know that much. Um, it's still not clear whether it's sporadic or autosomal dominant uh, with uh, incomplete penetrance. But it is clear that for a certain subset of patients, it's definitely um, autosomal dominant. And the gene that's linked to it is uh, PRPH2 which has some other uh, former names, that I, uh, but PRPH2 is the most common name used now. Um, and this uh, protein is a membrane protein that uh, localizes to the uh, photoreceptor outer segments and is uh, important for the structure of the discs. So when this protein is mutated, uh, the RPE cells are not able to uh, uh, to take up the uh, shed material from the photoreceptors, and this material accumulates between the retina and the RPE, uh, which causes those yellow deposits that characterize these diseases. Um, mutations in uh, PRPH2 have also been uh, associated with uh, butterfly uh, dystrophies, as well as uh, some other um, diseases, central areolar choroidal dystrophy, autosomal dominant RP, and then uh, Patients who uh, clinically have Stargardt's, um, actually some of them have mutations in this uh, gene as well. Um, this just kind of illustrates the, um, I guess, transition that we're, kind of, we're making in ophthalmology between uh, making diagnosis uh, solely based on clinical features to you know, incorporating genetic testing. Unfortunately, there's not like a one-to-one -one, uh, correlation in a lot of diseases, and pattern dystrophies uh, are, one of, are some of those. Uh, there are also mutations in uh, some uh, proteoglycans that are um, in the extracellular matrix between the photoreceptors that also have been associated with pattern uh, dystrophy. However, most of the patients that have adult vitelliform don't have mutations uh, in any of these uh, known genes. They estimate that maybe around uh, 10 to 20 percent of patients with adult vitelliform have uh, mutations in known genes. So, uh, that leads to the question of, you know, do these, what do these patients have that don't have uh, known mutations? Is it that we haven't found the mutations yet, or uh, do these uh, patients actually um, possibly have another disease like macular degeneration where there's not a clear um, uh, monogenic uh, inheritance? 
Uh, there is some overlap uh, between AMD and adult vitelliform, and some people have suggested that adult vitelliform is actually a subset of AMD. So uh, both of these oop, diseases are characterized by um, yellow deposits, but in adult vitelliform, uh, the deposits are underneath the retina and above the RPE. Um, this has been demonstrated on pathology. Uh, whereas in AMD, the deposits are below the RPE. You can see it pushing it up here, whereas here you can still see uh, the RPE going across here underneath the lesion. Um, so they, you, one might think that you could use pathology to distinguish AMD and adult vitelliform, but there is some overlap there as well, uh, where there are uh, patients that um, have adult vitelliform, where on pathology they have uh, basal linear deposits, which are characteristic of AMD. And also clinically, uh, you know, we know that drusen are characteristic of AMD, whereas vitelliform lesions are characteristic of, of adult vitelliform, but there are patients uh, who have both, and it's really um, unclear how we should categorize these patients. Do they have adult vitelliform or do they have AMD? Or do you know, some of these patients that just have these uh, central yellow spots actually have AMD as well? Um, I definitely think it's clear from the genetics that some of these patients that have vitelliform lesions definitely do not have AMD. They have you know, only adult vitelliform. Uh, they have looked at whether, uh, patient, whether adult vitelliform is associated with complement factor H, which it's not, and uh, HDRA1, uh, which it is, but um, it's questionable whether you know, they had enough patients uh, to pick up the association. So. Uh, so a little bit more about the clinical course of adult vitelliform and the other pattern dystrophies. Uh, they usually have a fairly good visual prognosis um, visual acuity can be, you know, somewhat decreased in the stage where they have um, these, this uh, hyperreflective uh, subretinal lesion on OCT. However, um, this lesion often resorbs over time and can leave uh, the patient with atrophy, which can actually result in very poor visual acuity, uh, such as count fingers. It's also possible for these patients to develop uh, choroidal neovascularization. Um, there have been some studies uh, on anti-VEGF. They tried to use anti-VEGF uh, for this, um, but that didn't help uh, visual acuity at all. Uh, but they did also use anti-VEGF for choroidal neovascularization secondary to adult vitelliform, and that uh, did work. Uh, photo, uh, PDT, or photodynamic therapy, uh, did not work. Um, they did a small study where they caused many patients, a few patients to lose vision and didn't improve anybody's vision with that. Um, and so since uh, adult vitelliform progresses uh, oftentimes to atrophy with poor vision, um, it's really you know, unfortunate that we don't have any uh, current strategies to try to prevent this from occurring. Uh, so one thing you know, that could potentially uh, ha show promise, since it does work for AMD, uh, are AREDS2 uh, vitamins, so lutein and zeaxanthin. Um, however, this has been totally not studied in the case of adult vitelliform. There's no evidence uh, for its use or against its use, and that was one of the main things uh, driving our study. A little bit of background on uh, macular uh, pigments. Uh, so uh, lutein and zeaxanthin, uh, I'm not sure what's happening here, okay. Uh, they are locali uh, localized to the Henley's layer, and they uh, are what give the fovea lutea that um, yellow color. And they uh, absorb blue light, and they are antioxidants, so they're thought to protect the uh, retina against uh, blue light and oxidative damage. So we are able to measure uh, macular pigment in patients' eyes by several different methods. By uh, one uh, older method, uh, Raman uh, spectroscopy, uh, Dr. Bernstein demonstrated that patients with macular degeneration have uh, low uh, macular pigment levels and that when they take the AREDS2 supplements, um, that uh, does increase their macular pigment levels. So this you know, kind of demonstrates that you know, low macular pigment is involved in the pathogenesis of AMD and that uh, demonstrates how taking those supplements could possibly help. And we'd like to see um, if this could be also demonstrated in adult vitelliform. Uh, the current instrument that we're using to measure uh, macular pigment is actually uh, the Heidelberg uh, spectralis, which uh, can use autofluorescence 
uh, to measure the macular pigment. So it's done on the same machine that can do an autofluorescence and an OCT. Um, the way it works is by, um, on a normal autofluorescence, you're measuring uh, lipofusion mostly in the RPE. And um, those of us that are familiar with the normal autofluorescence, there's that dark spot in the middle uh, in the foveal center, which is from the macular pigments absorbing that um, fluorescence from the lipofusion before it gets to the camera. So uh, by using that strategy, uh, we can measure um, macular pigments. So this is a typical uh, printout from the uh, macular pigment software. And basically, um, this is the foveal center here, and it uh, totals up uh, the measured uh, macular pigment uh, within this red circle, and then within the blue circle, and then within the green circle. And you can see that in the foveal center, uh, that's where macular pigment's the highest. This is a kind of like a line scan averaging uh, from the center to the periphery. And you can see that in the center, uh, the macular pigment's the highest, and then it drops off very rapidly as you uh, exit the fovea. So in this study, uh, the measure that we used was the sum of all the pigments within two degrees, uh, which is this number right here. It does give you a lot of numbers. Most of them uh, correlate really pretty well with each other. So I'm gonna uh, give you a little break before I go into you know, our study design. Uh, this is just some uh, photos from my uh, family reunion in uh, Olympic National Park. It was taken by my one cousin who is a big fan of the uh, iPhone uh, panorama group selfie. So uh, this is us in the Ho Rainforest and then at uh, Rialto Beach in the uh, Olympic Peninsula in Washington. So uh, a bit more about the rationale for our study. The um, main uh, driving factor is to figure out, you know, whether these AREDS2 vitamins um, are useful um, in adult vitelliform. However, uh, unfortunately, we don't have uh, the resources, or I guess even the rationale right now to do a huge study like AREDS2 to see whether, you know, they, um, you know, we compare patients that are taking them versus not taking them to see if they can reduce progression to atrophy and CNV. Uh, but we can measure macular pigment in our patients that we have here in clinic uh, just as a one-time thing uh, to see if their macular, macular pigment is low. If it is low, that does give us some rationale for using uh, AREDS2 in these patients. Um, other reasons uh, why it's useful to measure macular pigment in patients with pattern dystrophy is uh, to better understand uh, the relationship between AMD and uh, pattern dystrophy, uh, since you know, this could be a common risk factor if AMD patients have low macular pigment as well as the uh, pattern dystrophy patients. And maybe it could help to clarify you know, which of those vitelliform patients uh, really you know, have something that's more similar to AMD versus which ones, you know, maybe just are more likely to have, you know, PRPH2 or other autosomal dominant um, mutations. Uh, and this also could uh, tell us more about the pathogenesis of adult vitelliform. Um, if it's uh, autosomal dominant with incomplete penetrance, this could help us to understand what are those factors that cause one person with a mutation to develop it and others to not develop it. So in this study, uh, we looked at uh, patients with either adult vitelliform dystrophy or a butterfly-shaped pigment dystrophy. Uh, I excluded all patients that had drusen just because I didn't want to capture any of those patients that could just have like a uh, central drusenoid PED type of thing in macular degeneration. And I also excluded patients that had macular atrophy in both eyes. So you can see from this picture on the right that uh, this patient has some mild macular atrophy in the center after resorption of that hyperreflective lesion, as I showed earlier, and that uh, the macular pigment is very low right in the center just because that outer retina uh, is gone or, you know, not healthy. And I figured that's not useful information if there's no macular pigment just because it's, you know, there's no outer retina. Uh, so I, only, I excluded patients that had uh, atrophy in both eyes. And then I chose age match controls uh, that did not have macular generation, cataracts, or um, other macular pathology. Uh, and I looked at um, that number that I showed you, which is the macular pigment volume under the curve within the central uh, two degrees. Uh, we also measured in some of these patients uh, serum and skin carotenoids. Uh, so I was able to find uh, 11 patients and get them to get their macular pigment photos done. Uh, some of them had adult vitelliform, some had butterfly, and one patient had uh, 
adultiform in one eye and butterfly in the other eye, which has been uh, published in the literature before. Uh, surprisingly, the vast majority of these patients uh, were on AREDS2 uh, supplements, um, despite the total lack of uh, evidence for this and this disease. Are they Dr. Bernstein's patients? <laughs> um, most of them were Dr. Bernstein's patients, but I would say that 100% uh, of Dr. Vitali's patients uh, also are on AREDS2. So <laughs> I don't think it, right. I think part of it may be that uh, a lot of them come. Yeah, the macular issues were problems. People could put on the macula. The macula was funny. Yeah, I think a lot of times they come in with a diagnosis of macular degeneration initially when they're referred. So maybe that's why. Uh, there were uh, average older age, and uh, here's the female to male distribution. I'm going to show you, before I show you my data, uh, some other pictures from my family reunion. Uh, this was to celebrate my grandma's birthday. It's very hard to get uh, 40 Huangs to all do the same thing at once, as can be <laughs> illustrated by myself here. So it was quite an exciting time. Um, so we compared uh, the macular pigment uh, in that central two degrees between the control patients and the pattern dystrophy patients. Unfortunately, you know, we didn't demonstrate a statistically significant difference um, between the controls and the uh, pattern dystrophy patients. However, I think a, a major limitation of this was that uh, most of our patients were already on supplementation. So I tried to look at just you know, our three patients uh, with, uh, that were not on supplements that have pattern dystrophy, and there, didn't look, uh, uh, there wasn't a difference there either. But, it could really uh, be a limitation of the small numbers in this study. Mm -hmm. What kind of numbers would you expect in patients with mm -hmm. corneal macular degeneration? How different would they be from these numbers? Here? So, uh, they were about 33% uh, when they weren't on supplementation. So, uh, this is a different. Uh, this is a different measure, Whoa. but um, this is 148 uh, in. AMD patients without supplements, and then 219 um, in patients that are normal. Um, so yeah, about a 33% difference. And I did uh, a power calculation to try to figure out what kind of numbers uh, I would need to pick that up, and it's 26, which is not astronomical, but is still kind of a reach for a somewhat rare disease, but we're working well, on getting more. Correct. The controls are not on supplements. We excluded any patient, any normal people taking uh, so, taking A reds too. They were age matched. Yeah, because uh, it has been demonstrated that macular pigment uh, decreases with age. So um, I also looked at uh, skin and serum carotenoids, um, and in this I used a, a database of normals because I didn't have enough age matched controls. Uh, since all our, the older patients in our um, can ha in our study have AMD, but um, so I didn't demonstrate uh, any differences here, but the numbers you know were pretty small. So we ha uh, Dr. Bernstein has you know these uh, a study ongoing where he's measuring uh, skin and uh, serum carotenoids in uh, many different patients. Um, so I also uh, looked at those patients that I excluded because they had both Drusen and the teleform, and there were some uh, really interesting findings here. So uh, this one patient just had macular pigment measured, and that was in the normal range. However, uh, two of these patients that had uh, Drusen and uh, the teleform lesions had kind of shockingly low uh, macular pigment, um, skin, and serum carotenoids. So both of these patients have uh, macular and skin uh, levels that are less than the 10th percentile. Uh, for normals. And then uh, this one patient actually had undetectable uh, serum carotenoids, just totally below the detection limit of the HPLC. And they're the only patient we've had so far um, that has had that. And then the other patient had somewhat low serum carotenoids. Surprisingly, one of these two patients was taking uh, AREDS2 supplements, and I verified their refill history. So they're at least refilling them every month. So. It's uh, just surprising. So I'm not sure, you know, what to make of this. This is just a few patients, but it kind of, you know, does. It is interesting to think about its implications. 
Uh, so I talked about um, how we're uh, trying to increase our sample size. Um, so I will be uh, sometimes, you know, contacting you to let you know that your adult vitelliform patient is coming in for follow-up and that I've already uh, called them on the phone uh, to ask them if they'd be willing to get an additional picture when they get, you know, the rest of their <coughs> pictures done, uh, which is the macular pigment photo, and then uh, meet with Kellyanne, our study coordinator, uh, to get the serum and skin measurements if they're willing to do that. Um, so I have IRB approval and I've been calling some of them, so you may uh, see that happening. The retina clinic um, uh, can help you uh, if you have any questions. And if you have any patients you know, that are interested in participating and getting the, these measurements done, it's just a one-time thing, uh, you can just let me or the retina techs or Kellyanne know. Um, I'll also be trying to recruit more um, older uh, normals for our database, uh, so you may see me around uh, your clinic then as well. Dr. Mamelis was uh, very helpful the other day uh, with that. Um, and another uh, study that we're interested in doing in the future is to clarify, you know, all those other patients that don't have PRPH2 mutations, do they have, you know, autosomal dominant mutations uh, in other genes? So we're planning to use the uh, Utah population database um, to try to uh, link up these uh, patients that we have with adult vitelliform to see if they're related and then if they are, you know, maybe that's, uh, we can work on trying to find more genes for that, but that's a big project for the future. I'd like to uh, thank Dr. Bernstein for, um, you know, his guidance and for, you know, initiating all this, uh, this project. I'd like to thank uh, Jim Bell, who actually uh, came up with uh, the idea for this project. Chris Conradi, who's also working on uh, macular pigments in uh, normal patients and AMD patients. Uh, Kellyanne, uh, thanks to the photography department for taking all these macular pigment photos. Um, and Aruna in Dr. Bernstein's lab for running the HPLC. And uh, definitely thanks to the ARCS Foundation for uh, supporting me so that um, I can pursue these projects. Um, and that's it. <clears throat> yes. Uh, Dr. Bernstein can probably uh, talk a little bit more about that. So it's using resonance Rollins spectroscopy. I have a patent on that method. It's basically trying to blue light on the skin and measuring the Rollins that you'd like to do that. It's, it's very validated, very and very and non-invasive way to do it. It has been uh, commercially marketed as the biophotonic scanner that you may have seen around here that you used in pharmacy. It's a great way, it correlates very well with fruit and vegetable consumption and skin levels by biopsy and it's in the serum. Well, I also have core, I'll just want to say, I think it would be the, the telephone lesions, I think the thing that we're kind of seeing in these pattern is that even the ones who are on supplements are not all that high. If right. You look at the, my, the patients in my clinic, the, a, the a, AMD patients who come in have just, you know, they're all on supplements, they have huge macular pigment levels, much more than people I think that even, even the ones who aren't just ridiculous and low, like the few of are, are not all that high. So there may be something that they're not responding well to their supplements. Even though the, the pathology is mm -hmm. off, it's not like they have geographic atrophy or no receptors. Right. Paul, right. so. a question for you. Uh, you're using autofluorescence in these measurements. Um, and you've also used uh, resonance from mom in the macro. Which, which do you? What do you feel is more accurate? How do they correlate with each other? So resident trauma, if you do it in the, in the eye, is a difficult thing to do because it's all homemade systems that we make in there, and the light levels are very high. The, spectra the, the software or the method we have on the spectralis works very well. It's, but you have to have, at least to do it right, you have to have the newest generation spectralis, which has two, uh, two different green and blue ways. But the, soft, and the software right now is not FDA released. They're not FDA approved. So only, you have to have it under an IRB, and only like 10 sites in the US have this. But as, any, as Jim can say, it's very easy to measure. It takes you know, literally 30 seconds to do the measure. Do you think that is, that is accurate? It's, it's pretty accurate. I would love to do, if I have the funding and the equipment to do it, the spectralis could, in theory, be modified to do resonance. And then you would have everything together. Uh, that's a um, several hundred thousand dollar project. We would need more cooperation from the uh, 
type of work that we have. So I would, that, that would be the most specific way to do it, but the autofluorescence method is good. And someday, I work with the leaves of the general public, but it's not good yet. Uh, I mean, you can mention uh, dietary nutritional factors. Are you looking at those at all with these patients? Oh. Uh, uh, we're not uh, doing any uh, surveys or anything like that, but it could be, you know, useful since that was how, you know, initially uh, the studies were picked up in AMD in terms of it, uh, poor nutrition being a risk factor. So. Well, well, zero skin and zero serum in one suggests that this is a person who only eats potato. I mean, that's impossible to do. That's a clear sign no matter what. Yeah, we, the the biomarkers work very well. It's actually more efficient than doing, a, uh, doing nutritional surveys. Yeah, she did say she eats fruits and vegetables, but, mm -hmm. you yeah. know. She may have something else going on. She may have a mouth or something, right? If we find um, mm -hmm. occasional patients that we pick up with these real low levels, either have undiagnosed celiac disease mm -hmm. or, or something else going on. Yeah, she so actually had celiac disease. Yeah. So that one with the zero had celiac disease. Uh, Dr. Rosco. Any really nice, really nice presentation. Maybe it's a question for you and Paul. You use the term normal, and I'm wondering if anybody has done a mm -hmm. natural history study longitudinally, so do we really have an idea of what mm -hmm. a large normative database looks like to actually compare over time? Uh, in, a, in pattern dystrophy? Or just in anything, even in AMD. Oh. Uh, well, I can. Do that as best we can. Yeah. You know, that's what Chris someday talked about. <laughs> yeah, we're we're measuring as many as we can as we can in like kind of without disrupting without disrupting. And then trying to correlate yeah. the over time. That would be yeah, would be really useful. Yeah, that would be really interesting. I guess it would be more of a Dr. Bernstein question because, you know, my residency won't be forever. <laughs> uh, Dr. Owen? Thanks, Eileen. That was a great presentation. I just had a quick question if you thought of maybe controlling for supplement intake, the ARES2 intake. I don't know if it's been demonstrated that normal can increase the level of carotenoids, hmm. um, but if your um, case population is on the supplements. Mm -hmm. We can't necessarily control for that, and I think it might be a problem going forward. If right. People are being referred in for AMD. Right. Like you said, right. Um, there's probably going to be a high percentage coming in on the supplements, but you could potentially control for that by getting normal to take the supplements mm -hmm. to see if you might be able to find the difference. Yeah, that's a really good suggestion. I think a fair amount of. Uh, Dr. Bernstein's normals, uh, you know, could be potentially on supplements so, or other normals around the Moran. So. We have that. So I'd also want to add, you mentioned uh, towards the end about the Utah population database. And I just want to put in a little pitch about future projects that uh, can be done. We have, uh, for the Utah population database, a huge database of um, basically where you do family relationships with patients coming in. And we've been using it for the for the Mac Health project recently, where I'm taking the patients who come in with macular phalangitation with diagnosis and then asking, are these folks random patients? These are not related. Are they related uh, going back into the Utah population? In the latest kit that we did, where I, I just put in 10 newly diagnosed patients and newly identified at the Moran and asked, are they, are they related to any of our other patients? have or related among themselves. It turns out in that cohort of 10, three are from the same family. Oh my gosh. They are fourth cousins, so they obviously clearly probably don't know each other at all. But it shows that it's consistent with an autosomal dominant pattern. And right now I'm approved for doing it in MacTel, but I'm planning to expand that to essentially any eye disease. So eye diseases like Coates disease, like the coliform, they clearly have a familial pattern but we don't know what the genes are, and it's not clearly about some of the dominant. We can put in ICD-9 codes or just patient names and see if we should be pursuing a doing whole genome sequencing to find common genes. So if you have ideas of you know, diseases of cornea, you know, glaucoma, pediatric, all sorts of these things, you can start putting together. Thank you.
just just so everybody knows, uh, it's been put together now for a long period of time. It's a combination of uh, all of the genealogies that the Mormon Church has put together, along with all of the birth and death records that continue to expand. There's nothing like it anywhere in the world. So we have a unique opportunity and we can be taking advantage of that. Uh, there's been a lot of major breakthroughs that have happened and I see Barbara who wanted to raise her hand, but she's got some fascinating stuff. It would have been possible without the Utah population death. Yeah. yeah, just to kind of comment on that, so I've been doing a history exploration, as many of you know, and you cannot, even, you cannot only look at the familial patterns of the disease itself, but if it's genetic, you can then also look at associated comorbidities that may also be related to those eye diseases. So I'm just, yeah, looking at the UPDB, it's really an amazing um, resource that we have. Okay, thank you very much.